This week, an event which will reoccur almost weekly throughout the series. And here we learn more about the amount and degree of surveillance in the village. Cameras mounted everywhere are not enough for this number two, it seems. She wants a personal touch and has assigned individual observers to the more rebellious prisoners. And we can guess who's at the top of that list. Here, too, we learn more about the society of the village, such as it is. Later in the series, the prisoner refers to a group of the villagers as a bunch of tailor's dummies. Tonight, we see them more as museum mannequins, whom number two dresses at will for the enforced gaiety of a dark carnival. But now it's time to watch our hero pay the piper, even though number two calls the tune for the Dance of the Dead. There's a line I remember from an episode of McGowan's old Secret Agent series that seems fitting here. When his character John Drake is warned to be careful of that woman, he replies, that's one of my rules. Perhaps in the village, even his own rules are rules to which he is not subject. As we've just seen, Dance of the Dead is full of bizarre imagery, ambiguous symbology, and disturbing ideas. Beneath the seemingly meaningless, sinister fantasy on the surface, there are some significant points to be made, however. Take the costumes, for instance. The prisoner's alleged peers sit in judgment, dressed as Marie Antoinette, Caesar, and Napoleon. Powerful tyrants all. But the real power in the village lies with number two, who is dressed as an innocent, childlike fantasy figure. Immediately, we can sense that appearances in the village can be quite deceiving. Perhaps number two, as Peter Pan, is meant to illustrate to the prisoner, and to us, that the common view of maturity is to give up our fantasies. Peter Pan can't accept growing up. The prisoner can't accept remaining in the world of supposed grown-ups, the humorless, somber world of the village, where maturity is equated with conformity. At least in that respect, the village is the world. But what are we to make of the prisoner in his own tuxedo? Peter Pan says he has no costume because he doesn't exist. Strange talk coming from a fictional fantasy character. But perhaps our hero's own analysis is the more accurate one. He wears his own tuxedo because he is still himself. And yet in this crowd, he's entirely out of place, costume or not. But even in this heavy symbology of costume, the writer of this episode shows signs of lightness. The dictatorial doctor dressed as Napoleon, for instance, and the observer dressed as little Bo Peep, who's lost one of her sheep, because he is no sheep. This sort of humorous yet revealing irony is one of the hallmarks of this one-of-a-kind TV series. The prisoner dances with death in many forms in this episode. The death of his hopes, the death of his dreams, and the death of his friend Dutton, the fool who thought he could gain his freedom by giving the village what they wanted. But the real death the prisoner suffers here may very well be the death of the outside world, the life he led before his arrival in the village. We certainly get many indications that this is the case. An unknown stranger, a person from outside the village, is washed up on shore, and the prisoner's message to that outside world using the man is taken away from him and silenced. His friend Dutton, from his outside life, is taken away from him and silenced and the radio, broadcasting his own despair, is taken away from him and silenced. His links with his old life are systematically being discovered and eliminated by number two in an attempt to isolate him from an old reality and replace it with a sinister new reality, the perverted fantasy of the village. Dance of the Dead has usually aired as the eighth episode of The Prisoner, a positioning that now seems ridiculous. It was originally intended to be broadcast as the second episode, and we can see how fitting it is in that position. In it, for instance, our hero asks a multitude of questions about the village, even though he's warned that answers are a prison for oneself. In it, he states that he's new in the village, and he claims he's never seen a night here. And he's certainly still in shock from his abrupt displacement from his old world, with which he desperately seeks some sort of contact. 
Also, if we take Arrival and Dance of the Dead as a pair, we do get a new perspective on the nature of the series and the village. In Arrival, we're shown the international character of the village. In Dance of the Dead, we see that it crosses boundaries of time as well as geography. Has this place been here since the war, the prisoner asks? Before the war? Which war? The costumes, too, indicate the trans-temporal nature of the place. If we're led to believe that this is indeed a global village, are we now supposed to realize that it's a summation of history as well? If it is, then the prisoner must be the focal point, the individual in any time and place, fighting for his life against society, and every man, which incidentally was the name of McGowan's production company. Well, this is all pretty heavy stuff. Maybe we can lighten it up a bit with a couple pieces of trivia. Although this episode seems to have a lot to do with women, Mary Morris was a last minute replacement as number two. The uh, role was originally written for famed British actor Trevor Howard. And how about this one? When writer Anthony Skeen scripted Dance of the Dead, he was led to believe that he was actually revealing the identity of number one when he showed us the telex machine that refused to die. <laughs> Silly wabbit. Next week, our experiment in reordering episodes continues as we present Checkmate, formerly episode number 11. But just watch.